My presentation this morning is about driving Ireland's recovery and particularly the issue of consumer confidence. The one issue about my presentation is going to be about belief. Uh, business might be the new religion. Um, in fact, a friend of mine who's a, a priest, when asked in gatherings to do something religious, he takes up a collection. So I think business is religion and religion is business. Uh, and so this belief, I think, is the belief that we can actually recover, the belief that we are on a long way towards that recovery, and the ambitions that we have. Ambition is fundamentally about belief, the belief that we can deliver, that we can do it. So the presentation is um, a, a campaign that IBEC and the Small Firms Association is a critical part of that on driving Ireland's recovery, first of all sets out the ambitions of the Irish business community and it's a collection of those ambitions. And I'll try and put some uh, support uh, behind why I genuinely believe that this is a, a scenario that we are capable of delivering and one that is, is absolutely necessary. When we look at Ireland today, and Olivia mentioned my background in, in economics, I couldn't but have a graph about GDP growth or, or some such measure. What we really need to see is that the economy has been dragged back from the most exceptional fall in activity in any industrialized country ever. So we're, we've pulled the economy back from a free fall of a near minus 7% fall in GDP growth during 2009. And while we continue through 2010 and from parts of 2011 in recession, history will show that 2011 the economy was dragged back up into not sunlit uplands but at least above the water. But as we know, all of this was really achieved by export performance. However, I think it's important as a business community to identify that the turn in the Irish economy actually came in 2009 because businesses, be they into the domestic market or exporting, looked after the supply side of their business by taking costs out, ensuring productivity, being lean for business. And those businesses that faced effective demand have slayed the market. The effective demand that they've met have been in international markets. And we've seen an absolutely stellar performance, a record performance by our exporters. For some of those exporting companies, these last couple of years, and, the, and continuing, are absolutely halcyon days. They are the best times for Irish business that are exported. The tragedy is that the, those facing domestic demand, while having done the similar hard yards and got their supply side right, have not met effective demand. And that's because our consumers, in the main, as much for the lack of confidence as the lack of money, have not constituted effective demand because they've been continuously hit by shock after shock, some real, some perceived, and unfortunately sometimes the same shock dressed up 15 different times to spook you again as you go through this kind of fairground ride of, of horrors. Remarkable that we've managed to pull the economy from that type of freefall back in. Let's acknowledge that to start with, but there's absolutely more to do. The choice and I believe it is a choice. I believe that a lot of what we have is in our own destiny. Is what do we go for? Are we going to go for a growth which now at 1% and a prediction again for this year of about 1%? What's the potential growth rate of this economy? Once you determine where it is you want to go, then the actual it needs to be measured against that potential. If you settle, or if we settle for a 2% growth trajectory, and we grab that today, we say, that would be great, if we could even get back to 2%, that would be good. We need to be a little bit more ambitious than that. We need this economy to grow by 3 to 4%, and I'm talking about volume growth here. I'm not talking about prices. Prices will be on top of this. So 3% to 4% volume growth should be our ambition. Why that is necessary, why would you want to achieve this, People say growth is not for its own sake. It is actually to deal with the problems that we're currently suffering from, the lack of employment and the debt burden. Both of those crises will be solved by higher growth. So in that ambition, the business community have put forward in this Driving Ireland's Recovery campaign a number of stylized ambitions. 
And this is where the belief part comes in, the belief that you can do it. First of all, we should, as an economy, have an ambition to have a growth rate of double the EU average. Now, given the way the EU is performing, that's not an incredibly ambitious target, actually. But our ambition should be for Europe as well. Ireland should, and I'll come back on this a little later, have a very strong ambition for Europe and to be a leader within Europe because of the business community that we have here. Ireland is Europe, and the business community in Ireland is actually an incredibly strong example of European business succeeding. I'll give some examples of that in passing. But growth of the double the EU average, the EU currently has a potential growth rate of 1%, and they hope to get it to 1.5%. We should have an ambition of a 3% and possibly higher growth. A lot would say, well, sure, Ireland can't keep growing faster because today we're already at 133% of the European average, that our convergence play is over. Uh, Olivia helpfully reminded of some of the uh, places I've, I've been. Uh, the ESRI, much in, in uh, the IVA storm in the last week, uh, I was there in, in two phases. But in the early 1990s, we predicted a growth rate of 4% for the period 2000 and, sorry, 1992 to 1999, that seven-year window. There was a huge Stuart's inquiry at that point during the ERM crisis as to how we lost a run of ourselves. History showed that the growth during that period was double, closer to 8%. And so those then who are skeptical say, well, that's fine, but you'll not do that again because convergence is over. You've converged from 75% of the European average to be 133%. If you recall, a few years ago, we were told that it's the best place to live, which is a very dramatic thing, given that we thought, if this is, this is as good as it gets, I'm not getting out in the morning. But the good news is it's not as good as it gets. We've still got a lot more to achieve, because the prism in which we should look at Ireland is as a small, open, regional economy. There are 230 regions within the European Union. Ireland currently today is 35th. Take the island of Ireland and place it against other regions in terms of GDP per capita, we're only 35th. There's plenty of uproom. Places like the Utrecht region, Vienna, Ile de France, these are 200, 220% of GDP. London and the southeast is 300% of GDP. There's plenty of headroom here, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Our ambition in the next eight years should be to get us into the top 20 regions. A growth of 3%, if that's delivered, will push us to there. Of course, it's not growth for growth's sake. The OECD looks at better life countries, 11 different indicators of health status, education, attainment, and so on. Ireland's in the top, currently in the top 15 OECD countries. In fact, in, in other UN Human Development Index, Ireland's in the top five. And so it should be. We should be an ambitious country to have the best, the best of everything. And I think it's a business that actually derives that and that will drive it forward. But if we achieve on those other two elements, and then we will see us move into the top five in the OECD link of better life countries. So it's not just growth for growth's sake, but as I often quote Woody Allen, my favorite philosopher, it's better to be rich than poor if only for financial reasons. <laughs> How is that going to be achieved? I think this is the key part. Currently, the export share of indigenous companies, the share of exports derived by indigenous companies, is 15%. This includes the Kerry's, the Glanbias, Paddy Powers, the Ryanair's, the Glendimplex, the CRH's, and so on. Massive companies for 4.6 million people. Huge indigenous multinationals that operate out of here we still only have 15% of that cake. The ambition should be to complete that out to 25% in the next eight years. That ambition is with our exports continuing to grow. Obviously, we don't want our pharmaceutical companies, who are now 50% of that share, collapsing to allow us the very easy run through to have 100% of exports coming from indigenous companies and nothing else happening in the economy. Our other ambition, our balanced economic growth. I refer to these as Lowry drawings. Internationally, that works well with the Manchester, but people in Ireland think they're North Tipperary drawings. 
But the, um, these ones are a balanced, regional, balanced economic growth. Clearly, we had an imbalance in terms of domestic demand drove the Irish economy between 2000 and 2005 unsustainably. Our exports are driving our economy at the moment, but what we really need is balanced economic growth. And the theme of the conference today is to make sure that that shopping basket as a kind of reflection of domestic demand actually comes back up to rebalance our economy. That is firmly in the hands of the consumers. It's not actually external relations, which I'll uh, point to as well. What is this for? Well, the ambition should be to have two million people working by 2020. And again today, that seems like an incredibly hard ask in eight years to put in another 200,000 people at work. But if you went to your chairman, and if you were self-employed, talk to yourself, if your ambition is 1.8 to 2, and the chairman said, well, where were you three years ago when you said 2.1, it actually doesn't look very ambitious at all <coughs> to get 2 million people back at work. We've already been there. What we need this time is to ensure that there are sustainable jobs because we're replacing the 150,000 or so of our unemployment that was due to the fallout from the construction sector. And again, I'll come back to property will be significant. And finally, to co-join with the government's ambition to be the best country in the world in which to do business. We will make no distinction about scale. It doesn't make any sense to say best small country in the world. Aim to be the best country in the world. Scale doesn't actually matter. You're either the best place to do business or you're not. Small is actually to allow you to pick out different countries. Let's aim for being the best country in the world in which to do business. We're not that far away from that. This is not a huge ask. We've got lots of problems and lots of things that we know retard our businesses, but these things are imminently solvable. And they're solvable by ambition and by belief, and the belief that a society can generate growth by celebrating the successes of its business and encouraging its business to have stronger growth agendas. So why do we believe this to be possible? Why do I believe that 3% over the next 20 years, this is 3% per annum over the next 20 years, is a potential growth rate for the Irish economy? Whether you actually achieve it or not is a different story. And it's not the maximum growth rate. There will be years when the Irish economy will grow by more than 3%. That's this, how you cyclically adjust. You need to know the potential growth rate of your economy to have a conversation about structural balances in a treaty. The debate that we just had was about potential growth rate, but nobody was able to identify it or talk about it. We believe that potential growth rate is possible. And the reason is we've got form. Just like an athlete that's fallen off We've already been there. We've done it before. The convergence doesn't prevent us from doing it again. We know we can get our growth rates back up there. We know what the model is, and Ireland's got that model. It's a strong business community, strong, ambitious, and globalized, flexible workforces. We also have the capacity to achieve your growth rate. You need the factors of production. You need the capital the human capital, the infrastructure, the know-how, the entrepreneurial spirit, to bring all of those factors together. Take the infrastructure, me remarkable infrastructure now in this country, particularly around our roads and ports. We have lots more to do in telecommunications and water services, no doubt. But we all know that this gives us huge potential for our growth rates. I always wryly smile when I hear people say, isn't it a pity we just got the infrastructure when the economy stopped? Reverse that around. This means we've actually got the infrastructure for our recovery without bottlenecks occurring quickly and stopping uh, this march forward. Our unemployment is a tragedy, but one that we should take some confidence for because still we've got a malleable workforce. Most societies look to our unemployment and say the quantity of people whose last job was in construction is indicative of a structural problem in the economy. The reality is people ended up in construction because that's where the money was. In other societies it wasn't that their destiny was to be in construction. We have a different form of unemployment is my argument here. We have a much more flexible and malleable unemployed stock. That is a wonderful source for driving this growth rate. And again the capital 
We're seeing the machinery and equipment increase in all of our firms. We're seeing the foreign direct investment coming in. Any observable, neutral observer of the Irish economy can see the potential growth rate. This is why it's different to Greece and Portugal. It's not about just political slogans and statements and glib comments. It's about actually looking at the business model and looking at the structural factors in the economy. And they're immense, and it gives us immense confidence that we can achieve these growth rates and actually surpass them. There are no limits to our ambitions on this. We are not actually constrained, and we're certainly not constrained by demand internationally. In a 7 billion world, 4.6 million of us in a 7 billion world. Sadly, I worked this out. If we went out for a meal and the bill came to 1,000 euros, we'd have to stick in about 64 cents to the global bill. That's how small we are, but that's how much demand there's out there for our services. If we can move this along, we will not be demand constrained. So in that regard, we, how can we uh, do this? Well, this campaign, as I said, has four elements. Keeping Ireland strong in Europe. Now, we, we launched this campaign in the midst of the referendum. The referendum was an important issue, more important if we said no than it is to say yes, but there's more coming in Europe for us to take a lead on. We need to take a lead to say that our business model is what Europe needs. Our business model demonstrably brings prosperity and success. Ireland is the poster child of Europe in so many ways. We've had first mover advantage in lots of ways. We have fell into the hole faster than others. We've tried different things, be it in banking solutions or NAMA and so on. But the one thing that we really have got right in this country is a business attitude and a business structure that actually delivers prosperity and growth, as evidenced by the performance in exports. We'll be driving that on over the next couple of months. Keeping Ireland strong in Europe has issues that will come our way around euro bonds, corporation taxation, and we should be not on the back foot, on the front foot, as to say that Europe needs to be more like Ireland. So this may sound like the Skibbereen Eagle, but we generally uh, and genuinely have the strongest business region within Europe per capita, like nowhere else. It's the combination of all that U.S. multinationals, but increasingly, and we forget them so often, 4.6 million with the brands that I mentioned a few moments ago, the Ryanairs, Glen Dimplex, CRHs, Glanbias, remarkable. And then in the medical devices, the Craiganas, the emerging Irish companies. Why we need to be strong in Europe is we've got the best European story. Conscious of time, Olivia, I'll wrap up in a sec, is that Ireland's story is a European story, and we need to tell that. Two facts, two things. Irish whiskey is becoming such a, a great growth story and a phenomenal story. That's a European story. Jemison is a Pernod Ricard story. We can call it a French story if you like, but it's actually a European story told through Ireland. Infant formula, 20% of the global infant formula produced in Ireland, 20%, one in five, in an expanding middle class world of seven billion consumers, remarkable story. Again, this is a story of Irish companies like the Glambias and so on, but also the story of Nestle now they've taken over Pfizer and the known. Ireland is Europe and Ireland is one of the most driving successful parts of the European business model. We have a really strong hand to play in Europe. We should not see ourselves constrained in the fiscal budgetary banking space. Europe needs strong business for its prosperity. We need to go on that front foot. Restoring domestic demand is actually the shoe that hasn't dropped. And again, we can look around as to what factors we need, but we first of all need to believe we can do it and that we're actually on the way back. Supporting job creation and delivering world-class public services. These are planks and elements that our campaign will be built upon. Today, the restoring domestic demand fits in with the theme of the conference. Why we need this and what are the challenges? We're not blind to the challenges. This is a psychological test, by the way. If you see a mountain peak, that's fine. I actually see uh, dinosaurs grazing. If you see anything else there, you may need to see somebody. Um, but the first peak and the first challenge uh, that we have here is the debt burden. But this debt burden, this doesn't go away. Friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. Uh, assets can come and go, but liabilities tend to stay around. The debt burden is not going to go away, but so that, therefore, actually, the only way to get around this, you can plead for debt forgiveness till cows come home, 
but the actual best way to get around it is to reflate around it, reflate the economy so that burden is actually easier lifted. The second one is the global economy, and of course, we can see that this feeds into our daily lives with the Euro crisis in various countries around the world in a sequence. In fact, if you stand back, the world has never been in a better place. If you look at the actual stylized facts of the world when it comes to wars, famines, um, is that the stats and history will show that this is actually a golden age. Very little, relatively, is happening. What we've got is a crisis of wealth. We have a wealth recession. We don't have a recession like we've had in the past, and people spoke about the 1980s. These are wealth recessions. They're psychological recessions, and they may be all the harder for that. But the first, but the biggest challenge of all is actually ourselves. If we don't believe this, if we don't believe in the power of business and the power of actually driving this forward in a better future, then it won't happen. If you don't believe it's going to be 3 or 4%, it won't happen. Increasingly, that's coming around is the immigration story. That cannot, does not necessarily have to be an inevitability. This type of growth rate can provide the opportunities for people to come back like they did in the 1990s. That's what we must be striving for. We should also not just look the way things say on the tin. We need to look deeper onto this. I'm from Shum. Uh, the saw doctors have a great line, the travelers have settled and the settlers have got, and the settled have gone traveling. It's not always clear on the label as to what actually is the behavioral response. We shouldn't see immigration as an inevitability nor as a tragedy, but what we have to create is the opportunities. Finally, we need to change these terms a way to growth, prosperity, possibility, and finally, a golden generation. I genuinely believe we're on the cusp of a golden generation. I believe that part of this has already been delivered, and part of that is a reality that business people can see. And as Patricia said before, and Olivia mentioned this morning, small firms association and those who create those businesses are incredibly optimistic and are already driving this forward. So finally then, in terms of our ambitions, those seven ambitions are all around the same theme. Make Ireland the best place to do business. I believe we can deliver on all of the other ambitions. Thank you very much.